Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and today I'd like to talk to you about some basic immunology. I've tried to keep this as simple as I possibly can, which is a bit of a joke because nothing in immunology ends up staying simple. But we'll try anyway. The interesting bits of immunology from my point of view is the ability to create an adaptive response to a specific antigen. That antigen might be something appropriate, like part of a deadly disease, or it might be something inappropriate, like pollen or your own cells. But the immune system responds to them in basically the same way. Now there are lots, lots more cells than I've drawn here, including those that take you from a stem cell through to a mature cell, but they're not necessary for your understanding at this point. All of these cells come from the same sorts of stem cells which are in the bone marrow, and they differentiate into two lines. On the lymphoid side, we have our erythrocytes, which are our red blood cells responsible for carrying oxygen around the body. Our megakaryocytes, which break up to form platelets to stop you bleeding to death on a regular basis. Our monocytes and macrophages, which eat up cellular debris and things like bacteria. Our granulocytes and our neutrophils, which are again a first line of defense. And our mast cells, which don't seem to do terribly much except for allergies and cancer. On our lymphoid side, we have all of our lymphocytes, including our natural killers, our helper T's, and our B lymphocytes, which will mature to plasma cells when activated. And these are the guys that produce our antibodies and are of particular interest. Our adaptive immune system is all about antigens, which are usually foreign proteins that the immune system can respond to, and antibodies, which are little proteins produced by the B lymphocytes and the plasma cells they become that are highly specific in binding to those antigens. They achieve this because the binding sites at the end of the antibody are very prone to mutation in the B cells, and this is permitted. This allows them to have basically millions of different potential combinations for binding to completely unknown and unpredictable external antigens. Now occasionally you will get basically an accident where an antibody is generated that will bond to normal natural proteins in the body. Usually there are regulatory systems to try to suppress this from happening, but when it does happen and it gets through, this is how you get immune mediated disease. Now there's lots of different types of immunoglobulins in addition to the potentially millions of different sorts of antibody binding sites. IgG and IgE are fairly simple. These are just in mammals, by the way. IgA is a dimer, so it's got two antibodies bound together. And this is usually found in secretions like milk or across mucosal surfaces like the gut and respiratory tract. And IgM is a great big molecule which has five different antibodies coming off it, which binds to pathogens and clumps to just pull them out of circulation. Now IgG is the one we measure in blood. It's the most common. But it's IgE that's responsible for our allergic symptoms. So if we're doing a blood test for allergies, we're usually measuring IgG when it's IgE that's responsible. And just because you've got a high IgG level, it doesn't mean you've got a high IgE level to the same antigen or vice versa. This is why we still do intradermal skin tests for a lot of our allergies. It's also interesting to note that for many infections that occur across mucosal surfaces, when we've been using an injected vaccine, it definitely increases IgG, but it's really IgA that we want because this is the one that's most useful for preventing the infection in the first place. This is why there's increasing developments in intranasal and oral vaccines. So how do vaccines work? Well, vaccines are basically target practice for our immune system. We take a whole bunch of antigens for whatever the disease is we're trying to target, and we expose the immune system to it so it has time to build up specific antibodies to fight it off. Doing this takes time. 
So initially you have a naive animal that has no antibodies to its target disease. We give it its first vaccine and initially there won't be much response for a couple of weeks. Then we get a little response but unless you reinforce it those antibody levels will drop. When you give the second dose you will then have a very rapid very big response that takes a long time to die down. And while you have lots of antibodies circulating, you're most likely to be protected. This is why most vaccines require multiple dosing. Some will even require three. And eventually these antibody levels will drop and we will need another booster to bring them back up again. Now, one of the current debates in vet science is how long it actually takes these antibody levels to drop for our core vaccines like rabies, parvovirus, distemper, and infectious hepatitis. Some are really only one to three years. Um, kennel cough, for example, its antibodies only persist for about nine months. But for things like parvo, it might be three years, it might be seven years, it might be nine years or longer. Just most experiments haven't been conducted for more than nine years because that obviously takes more than nine years to do so. So a lot of people are now choosing to do titer testing where they measure this antibody level before they decide to vaccinate. And that's perfectly fine in an adult dog. Juvenile animals or animals that have never been vaccinated still need the normal sort of booster series to get them started. Though a dog over six months will possibly require less of those initial boosters. So why are puppies and kittens and other baby animals different? And that's because they will have antibodies from their mum, either across the placenta or through the milk. That's what colostrum's for. And these antibodies from mum offer protection, but they haven't trained that baby animal's immune system to respond to that disease. So they're great, they're very useful, but they often mean the animal won't respond to a vaccine if you give it too young. So if we give an animal a vaccine too young, which varies from species to species, if there's too much antibody, it just won't respond at all because mum's antibody will mop up the vaccine and the pup's immune system learns nothing. This is why we give multiple doses because at some point, there will not be enough of mum's antibody so we can start having our own immune response. The trick is to not actually catch the real disease between the time when mum's antibodies are dropping and the pups are starting. Now you might ask, is it possible to just measure antibody levels in the juvenile animals and then use less vaccines? It probably is, but mostly we just don't bother. We just use our normal sort of routine series, which depends on brand and species, because that covers the overwhelming majority. Adverse reactions to vaccines in animals that young are extremely unlikely because their immune system is so naive. It's complete and mature, it just hasn't been trained against lots and lots of different antigens. So what are some of the adverse reactions from vaccines that everybody's going on about? Well, the most common ones are actually fever and swelling at the injection site anyway. These are perfectly normal reactions anytime you have any sort of immunological stimulus for the body. They're practicing fighting off an infection. It's perfectly normal, very common, just a little bit inconvenient. More seriously, sometimes we will have allergic reactions, which can range from somewhat comical to very serious. And potentially immune mediated diseases. These are very, very uncommon and often unproven and I will discuss IMHA, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, possibly the one that gets the worst rap in another video. 
but you do need to understand all the basics before we talk about IMHA in more detail. Severe reactions are extraordinarily rare. We still vaccinate our animals because the risk of the actual disease is still higher than the risk of all the side effects. I'm not telling you to not vaccinate your animals. You should always vaccinate your animals unless they're already sick. But you should take your local vet's advice for what's common in your area and for local disease prevalence because not all diseases are everywhere. So not all locations have the same degree of risk. So I hope our little immunology basics make sense for you. My name is Dr. Ferox and I will see you real soon with some more immunology videos. So subscribe so you don't miss them. I'll catch you next time.